The Joy at Guantanamo, the story of how the 90 Chicago area naval reservists will spend their holiday season aboard the destroyer escort, the USS Daniel Joy, now stationed at Guantanamo, Cuba. The Joy formerly was the largest Navy warship on the Great Lakes. For 11 years, it was stationed at the foot of Randolph Street at the Navy Reserve Armory, where it served as the flagship for the 9th Naval District Reserve Training Squadron. For those 11 years, it was used to train Chicago's Naval Reservists, but this was soon to change. The date was last October 2nd, when the Daniel Joy and her crew prepared to leave for active service. On hand were Mayor Daly and Admiral Ira Nunn, Commandant of the 9th Naval District, and many other civic and military officials. The Joy and her crew, along with thousands of other reservists around the country, answered President Kennedy's call to meet the world threat of communism. Left behind were many loved ones. For many of these men, this was the third activation. The Navy's largest freshwater ship stopped first at Newport, Rhode Island, and three weeks ago arrived at Guantanamo Bay. Just last week, WGN Newsreel Supervisor Dick Hance flew to Guantanamo in a Navy C-119 to take a look at the Daniel Joy. We wanted to show you how the boys will be spending the holiday season. Is their morale high? Is it true that our reservists are loafing now that they've been activated? You can see the answers on this film taken by a WGN News cameraman. This is the airfield at Guantanamo, or Gitmo, as it's called. The United States' first interest in the base started during the Spanish-American War when the U.S. Marines needed the base for the campaign against Santiago de Cuba, just 40 miles to the west. It became apparent already at that time that the land would someday be a valuable base for naval operations. In 1903, we leased the land from Cuba. It was then named the U.S. Naval Station. It wasn't until 1934 that a formal treaty was signed with Cuba for full control of the 45 square miles comprising Gitmo. This treaty gives the United States what amounts to de facto sovereignty over the land. The treaty can be abrogated only by mutual agreement of the two governments. With the base now the valuable training ground for the U.S. Atlantic Fleet, that will never happen. Gitmo is located on the eastern end of Cuba. It possesses a landlocked harbor of two basins about four miles wide and ten miles long from north to south. A narrow entrance gives protection from storms and safety from surprise attack by sea. This probably is the finest natural harbor in the world. That fact, along with its strategic location in respect to the U.S. mainland, makes Gitmo a must in any U.S. military plans. Over 10,000 men are stationed at the base today. Last year, more than 180 ships held training exercises here. It is solely a training station for the Navy's Atlantic Fleet. The Joy will be here for six weeks before taking its place in the Great Atlantic Force. Separating Gitmo from the rest of the Cuban mainland is a six-foot fence with a barbed wire stretched across the top. The fence, you'll remember, was prominent in the Cuban fiasco earlier this year. The bearded Cuban premier accused the United States of planning attack of his country from Guantanamo. Castro was convinced we were maintaining the base to use it as a springboard for attack against his people. One can't help but draw the comparison with the barrier which today separates East and West Berlin, both lines of demarcation. Democracy on one side, communism on the other. Needless to say, Gitmo is a thorn in the side of Castro. He wants us out, but we're there to stay. To keep things in order, several hundred U.S. Marines are stationed along the border. The only crossing point between U.S. and Cuban territory is graced by flags of both countries. This is the country's Brandenburg Gate, the nation's Friedrichstrasse crossing station, the symbol of a walled-off Cuba. All U.S. personnel on the base are not allowed to cross the line of demarcation. They are restricted to Gitmo's 40 square miles. But several hundred Cuban civilians are allowed to pass through the gate. They are hired by the U.S. government to work in base machine shops, laundries, carpenter shops, and in other civilian positions. But when their job is finished, they must return to their homeland. Oddly enough, we spotted a Russian freighter at Gitmo. Behind the barbed wire fence, it was in a section of the harbor controlled by Cuba. Few people realize that not all of Guantanamo Bay is under the jurisdiction of the United States. Cuba uses its portion of the harbor as a major shipping center. After our general tour of the area, we set out to find the Daniel Joy. Gitmo's harbor is lined with many piers, each filled with rows of naval ships. Finally, we picked it out. Chicago's representative at Gitmo. Good old number 585. To say the least, the crew was happy to see us. Anything from home is a morale booster. 
The Joy is 18 years old. It was named for the late Daniel A. Joy, a Navy pharmacist mate second class who was posthumously awarded the Purple Heart and the Navy Cross for heroism in the Second World War. Our first impression, these men are working, working hard every day. Loaf, they don't know what that word means. Every day since arriving at Gitmo, these men have been out on the Caribbean from 7 a.m. to 6 p.m., undergoing extensive training exercises. We were on board only a few minutes when it was cast off, and we were on our way to a day on the Caribbean with the Daniel A. Joy. The ship is accustomed to rugged warfare. During World War II, the Joy logged duty in both the Atlantic and Pacific, earning two battle stars. Current plans call for the Joy to wrap up its training at Gitmo around January 5th. Then it'll be ready to join the Atlantic fleet. As we leave the harbor, other ships line the sea walls, many much larger than the Joy, but all there for the same purpose. To us, the boys look to be in pretty good shape already. They mean business. They know that they've been called up to do a job. They have respect for their ship and their superiors, and they're too busy to be homesick. Do they gripe? Sure they do, sometimes. The biggest complaint? Mail service. Being out at sea all day, prompt mail delivery is important to the men. The boys also want, believe it or not, more water for their baths. They're rationed to 25 gallons a day right now. But beside that, there are no major complaints. This is Commander Robert F. Flott, captain of the Daniel Joy. In civilian life, a partner in a Chicago actuary firm. He left behind at 1025 Bell Street on the south side, his wife Dorothy and two children, Cynthia, 14, and 11-year-old Robert. This is Captain Flott's first command. He's been a reservist for 20 years and served on destroyers during World War II and the Korean conflict. What does the captain think of his crew? In his words, I can honestly say that I have the finest group of people on any ship in the Navy. The captain says his men understand the life and problems they face, but they also realize that in time, things will be back to normal, and once again, they'll be able to resume a normal civilian life. Says Captain Flott, the crew knows it's here to do a job. That job will be done well until we get orders to return to Chicago. The work isn't all physical aboard the Joy. Time to study for the next rating test is hard to come by. There's just too much other work to be done. This is fire control technician third class J.A. Castrojohn, a Chicago fireman, but on the Joy, he's a talker. As you can see, things might not be quite the same when the boys get home. Chief Petty Officers Ronald Andaman of Milwaukee and Frank Bacchesto of Park Forest show us why. All the fellows are doing this if they can. This is one of the hedgehog mounts aboard the Joy for anti-submarine warfare. All of the men have their specialties aboard ship, whether it be gunner or cook. Of course, everyone looks forward to this one. Good old mess duty. Everybody has to take his turn at this job. But they say the good thing about it is you don't go hungry. Below, in the engine and boiler rooms, the massive racks of gauges and dials are continuously under the watch of the crew. The Joy's maximum speed is 24 knots. Its total shaft power, 12,000. It can go 5,000 miles without refueling its 96,000 gallon fuel storage capacity. The ship generates its own electricity, converts salt water to fresh water for human consumption, and furnishes the ship with heat and air conditioning as needed. These men make the ship move. They run the engines and the generators, and they make all of their own repairs. And no matter what happens aboard ship, there's always someone around whose specialty it is to take care of it. The faucet is broken, we need a plumber. He's machinist mate first class Edward Malicki of 709 South Dennis Street in suburban Wheeling. Now we're ready for action. Whenever any type of drill is held aboard the Joy, general quarters is sounded. The bullhorn sounds. All hands, man your battle stations. In real battle, this alarm is sounded every time there's a chance of trouble ahead. Each man has his own position. To these men, this is just like the real thing. In making ready for general combat, telephone and communications lines are set up between the commander and his staff on the bridge, and the guns and control centers on deck. Ammunition storage hatches are opened, and shell passers make ready. Firefighting and disaster crews stand by and make ready for any emergency. Hatches to the interior part of the ship are sealed and made watertight. The ship now runs on its own air conditioning system, completely cut off from the outside. On the bridge, the captain and his crew of experts make ready to engage the enemy. The officers and combat information center are set to take down and chart all information fed to it from all parts of the ship. 
The captain must know what's going on everywhere. The crew handles live ammunition. They fire the real thing. This ammo is for one of the 40 millimeter mounts. It is fed manually to the gun in clips of four rounds. It can be fired in short bursts or in rapid fire. The spotter searches the horizon for the enemy. Flags are raised to warn of live fire. Pulling targets for the joy are training planes based at Guantanamo. They pull cloth sleeves about 500 to 1,000 feet behind the plane. After radar fixes its eye on the approaching aircraft, the spotter finds it through his binoculars. The target is spotted and the firing begins. Going off in the background is one of the two 5-inch 38 caliber mounts aboard the Joy. It's used primarily for surface and anti-submarine warfare. Lieutenant William Hattendorf of LaGrange told us the Joy's gun crews are among the most accurate of the eight naval reserve ships called to active duty. The lieutenant says that with the ship's new equipment, no one can top it. Here is one of the two twin 40 millimeter mounts on the Joy. It is used mostly for anti-aircraft combat. This was the most effective anti-aircraft weapon in World War II. An analyzer takes aim for the five inch and 40 millimeter gun simultaneously for coordinated concentration of attack. The analyzer relieves the operators of the guns the task of pinpointing their targets. All they must do is pull the trigger at the right time. This is the Joy's executive officer, Lieutenant Commander Raymond Wells of Evanston, touching off a simulated fire for practice by the firefighting team. In civilian life, Lieutenant Commander Wells is a television director at a Chicago commercial television producing firm. These drills are likely to come anytime. This particular one hit during general quarters when a firefighting squad is most likely to be put to work during real combat. These drills are frequent sites aboard the Joy. No one knows just when or where the next one will hit. During our day aboard the Joy, a simulated atom device was exploded underwater, showering the ship with radioactive debris. With the latest in radiation-proof suits, these men are completely sealed off from the outside world as they detect and hose off the radioactive material. After this exercise, technicians scour the ship from stem to stern and with individual Geiger counters, determine the possibility of remaining hot spots. Then the deck is marked so the whereabouts of these hot spots can be recorded. And so, an average day aboard the Daniel Joy continues. Are these men loafing? Are they complaining because there's nothing to do? I think we've seen the answer. Not one person on the Joy feels unwanted. They know why they're there. Of course, they hated to leave their families, but they know there's a job to be done. There was a crisis. They were reserves, so they went. There have been numerous reports coming from army camps around the nation saying reservists have nothing to do. The Kennedy administration has been criticized for calling up all these reservists, taking them away from their families and good jobs, then putting them into camps with poor equipment and nothing to do. Even Secretary of the Army Elvis Starr admitted there were problems of this type. But you can count Guantanamo out if you're talking about loafing stations. These men are working 16 hours a day. They're out at sea from 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. And they have yet to get a day of liberty. They are too busy to worry about complaining. Why? When these men were activated, the ships and facilities were ready for them. The Navy also called in fewer men. And two, a fine job of Navy public relations has made it easier for the fellows when they had to leave home. The Navy band was on hand when the Joy left Chicago back in October. Dignitaries spoke, families of the crew sat in special places of honor. And all of this made things easier. When will the boys be home? We have good news. Commander Flott told us that if the world situation eases, it could be July 1st. But probably foremost in the minds of friends and relatives is, where will the boys be tomorrow? Christmas Day. The ship was scheduled to dock at Montego Bay, Jamaica tomorrow morning for 24 hours Liberty. But just a few minutes ago, WGN News was informed that all Liberty has been canceled. The reason? Just too busy. Christmas will be just another work day on the Caribbean. But there was one message the crew asked us to leave for all of Chicago. That is, have a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. I'm Jack Taylor, wishing you the same.